Dr. Strack is back uh, again for round three. Uh, we're very excited. Um, so we're going to treat this as we've done before. Uh, Note-taking activity, so make sure you've got something to write with, something to write on. Um, super happy to have you back. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I will step aside. Hey guys, please be seated. Thank you all. Good to see you too. Dr. Gerdes, I expect you to take good notes and pay attention. All right. All righty then. I guess you noticed some things were going on this past weekend, this past week. The whole world is experiencing a pivot. So let's let's lay all the school stuff aside and let's just talk for about a minute. Look at it. Playtime's over, ladies and gentlemen. Playtime's over. Uh, we're facing a very unique challenge, and it's a lot bigger than Israel and Gaza. It deals with China, it deals with Russia, and uh, it deals with Iran. And so you've got a border that's been a sieve. So it's estimated we could have as many as 500 cells in this country based on the fact that several million have come into our country. We have no idea who they are, where they're from, why they're here. Now, the overwhelming majority are just folks that <laughs> want to get out of where, they, you know, they want a better life. But you still got to always know who's here, why are they here, and where are they going. That's reality. So I have a little phrase, I'd like you to write it down. It's called getting mugged by reality. So for a while, school is kind of a, you know, especially on Mondays, kind of a bummer. You know, who wants to be in class on a Monday? We're still trying to recover from the weekend. And I'm, that's not a bunch of partying or getting high, all of that nonsense. It's just the way we live and how we act. Mondays, for some reason, are not a day we wake up feeling like dancing. Is that a fair assessment? All right. So I want you to know, though, the issue is no longer, hey, we want to encourage you to give your best. We want to help you be able to make sure you're, you're able to do all the requirements. We want to help you to get, get some help in this course that will help you finish. And wouldn't it be great if we got a college education? Wouldn't it be great if you could accomplish that? But look at me. We're now talking about uh, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? We're now talking about how in the world would you provide for your family? We're looking at three or four challenges. Uh, the market in the next eight or nine months could really get rocked. Uh, gas prices, because we no longer create oil and energy in our country. We're the number one in the world. God gave us the most blessed nation in the world to be able to provide fuel for the rest of the world for about 30 years and it benefit America. We stopped all that. Uh, so I just want you to know you're going to look up over the next month or two and it's either going to be, you know, just some challenges in the Middle East, but this very easily, it's like a fire. Fire is burning in an area, right? But a wind comes along or somebody tries to help it, all of a sudden that fire can jump the road, jump the breach. And I'm not trying to be melodramatic. I'm just telling you, I'm at a stage of my life where I can live anywhere I want to live, do whatever I want to do. Uh, and and I'm, at a, I'm at a blessed place. But I also want you to know, I realize that what I have planned the next five years is a jump ball. Okay, now, I've been to Israel 101 times. I've met the president of uh, President Abbas of the West Bank uh, some five times. I've met President Sisi over Egypt. I've met King Abdullah over Jordan. All these guys three, four times. Uh, certainly been with Benjamin Netanyahu probably, I want to say 10 times personally, but probably 15 or 20 through the years. He's been around a long time like I have. I'm an old dude. So I want you to know that all that we're hearing intel is that between Iran and Russia and China, it could get interesting. Now, I'm not 
I say that because we're, we're going to have a time to get together this afternoon. If you want to, I know spending an hour with me probably doesn't blow your dress up. For some reason, I enjoy it, but I just want you to know, we'll talk today about anything you want to talk about. Anything goes this afternoon, just for what it's worth. Number two, though, I wanted to just kind of turn the thermometer up, excuse me, the thermostat up just a couple points so you realize that what you're doing in this course could, I can't guarantee it, but based on all the, you know, Central Command, you know what Central Command is? It's in Tampa, Florida, and they control all the special forces anywhere in the world. So we're talking about Green Berets, we're talking about the SEALs, right? We're talking about the Rangers, we're talking about the, the ladies and gentlemen that do the heavy lifting. They do things in parts of the world you don't even want, you and I don't even want to know about. Central Command has a phrase. I want you to write it down. It's just an interesting phrase. They call it when they hear all this chatter and they know what's going on. They know stuff we don't know. They call it noise in the system. Noise in the system. And I've, I've spoken several times at Central Command. I've known several of those that have been either in charge or the number two guy at Central Command. And I'm telling you, whenever they've said there's noise in the system over the last 15, 20 years, there's been something that's all of a sudden been front page news. So they don't ever tell anybody what it is. They can't. We don't want them to violate that confidence. But I'm just saying, hey, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know what dreams you got, I don't know what aspirations you got, but I'm telling you, straight up, and I'm not paid a penny to be here, is there's noise in the system. So this isn't just about, hey man, let's, get, let's take some good notes, let's stay awake, I know it's Monday, hey, we're going to have this optional meeting this afternoon, if you want to come, it'll be worth a couple points, all that kind of stuff. I just want you to begin to realize the thermostat's up a couple points, and really the issue is how prepared do I want to be for everything that's coming in the world? And am I going to be able to prepare myself so that I can have a job that will provide for my family no matter what goes on? And you may have a, a concern about certain areas. You know, we all have uh, backgrounds. We all have burdens. I've always been worried about all the kids that uh, go through all the foster homes. Remember, I went through some uh, six different foster homes situated, court-mandated situations. I know all about detention centers. I know all about the kids that have been thrown away. So I, I have some of those areas of concern. You have certain things. You care about what happens to certain people. But you're not going to be able to make a nickel's worth of difference unless you prepare yourself. Does that make sense? No preacher talk, no one trying to be dramatic, I'm just telling you. You and I need to know this basic truth. Please write it down, big letters. The future belongs to those of us who are prepared. In fact, I'd like for you to write that down and then it, whether on your computer, your phone, or pen, pencil, lipstick, mascara, whatever you're using, I want you to kind of put a line through the, and I would put down my, my future. We're not here talking to you today about the future of the planet. We're not here to tell you about some of the warnings the Bible's given that's gotten some people going, wait a minute, isn't that what that, you know. So that's not what this, this is about my future, your future. Does that make sense? It's called personal possession. I don't know if you remember Doubting Thomas. You know that phrase, Doubting Thomas? And you know where that phrase comes from. There was a guy in the Bible that was one of the disciples. And the, when Jesus rose from the dead, Thomas was not at any of the appearances he made. He made some ten appearances over 40 days to show himself alive. And so they began to say, Thomas, he's alive. Thomas, he's real. Thomas, he kept all his promises. He rose from the dead. And Thomas goes, this is why it's called Doubting Thomas. Hey, 
I'll believe it when I see it. But isn't that how some of us are? I mean, let's be honest. I'll believe it when I see it. So here's what I want you to know. There are some truths that unless you believe it, you probably aren't going to see it. And unless you're willing to realize my future is going to be in direct proportion to what? Am I prepared? So let's talk bottom line stuff. How is it we need to be prepared? Number one, mentally. Mentally. Now we got all kinds of IQs in this room. There's great variance in the IQs in this room. And I can, can I be honest with you? You can have an I, a high IQ and still be achieving way down here, even below the average line. One of my favorite sayings, I, please write this down, I, I think you'll like it. Why don't, why don't we put an end to average? I don't want you to man, go through some of the real, you, you've been given some special motivation, special specialization in certain areas to help us be ready to conquer being in college. I mean, it's a, it's a lifesaver. I didn't have any of what's going on in these bridge courses when I was here. zippity doo dot. You got a pat on the back, pat on the head, you had to keep up with everything, right? So look at it. Why don't we put an end to average in our own life? Don't be average. Oh man, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. Here's my favorite. Hey man, how you doing? Well, I'm doing good under the circumstances. Well, get out from under the circumstances. What are you doing under there? I never let the circumstances control my life. I never let them. Man, I had horrible circumstances, but when I was given a way out called faith in Jesus, I grabbed it. And when he said, Jay, flush that stuff, I flushed it. And when he said, Jay, quit jiving around, sit there and keep your mouth shut, for the first time in my life, I sat there and kept my mouth shut. Does that make sense? So, I said an end to average. I'd never really even been average, but I, I didn't want to just be, I didn't want to settle. So, I have to prepare myself. And remember, what does the word mean? If we're talking about preparing yourself mentally, what does the word prepared mean? It's a Latin word. It means to be pointed in the right direction. Now, I went to school here 50 years ago. I get lost every time I come. The only building I really know what's what is the chapel. I'm pretty sharp, right? It's got that, you know, that steeple on the top. And I, I, I've got down where the reflection pool is. I don't want to brag, you know, but I, I got that down. But I'm always asking, hey man, where's this, where's that? So, I believe it's helpful to be pointed in the right direction. And that's what this course is attempting to do and you'll get out of it just like everything else what you put into it number one point in the right direction number two made complete you know why we have certain things we put in our life to fill up the emptiness in our life but when you've been made complete when the bucket is full you don't have a lot of needs to be putting stuff in there just to fill the emptiness in your life. So being made complete, number one, being pointed in the right direction. And number three, it means to be equipped for battle. Be ready for battle. Now, how do you prepare yourself mentally? How do you think? Number one, anything in your life that dulls the way you think, just, as, just for free, I think I'd flush it. When I gave my heart and life to the Lord, I flushed the methamphetamine, uh, I flushed crystal, I flushed uh, uh, all the acids, I flushed all the pot. I mean, the rats were high in the sewer for months, all right? I, I flushed it. I want you to know that I wanted to learn how to think. How to think. Alright? For myself. Not let circumstances, 
not get all nervous because everybody around me is nervous. I want to be kind of the captain of my ship, if you will. I wanted to learn how to think. So what you're doing in this course, right here, this course, is to help you mentally. And look at me. Don't ever be ashamed of needing help. If I had the time, I could give you the names of a hundred people, minimum, that in my life have come around, put their arm around me and said, Jay, man, you've you got so much going for you, but man, if you don't stop that, you you got some things in your life that will keep you from ever being what you want to be. So we all need help. It's not a weakness to go, hey man, I'm struggling with this. Do you have anything you're struggling with? Just us girls here. Look, anybody struggling with it? You don't have to raise your hand, but a little nod. I want to hear the rattle. All right, right? We all got stuff we struggle with. So that's not a sign of weakness to go, man, I need to get a little help with this. I'm having a hard time with this. And some of the stuff, let's be honest, they want you to learn at college, you're going, what's that got to do with anything? And it won't be till five years you get through college, or maybe ten, that you go, Oh, yeah. Maybe that's why I was supposed to take that. Oh, yeah, I remember that. All right? So, and by, by the way, you, you, attitude determines your altitude. So when we talk about learning how to prepare yourself and be made complete mentally, this first of all begins with a change of attitude. All right? My grandmother, who was the only real consistent person in my life that was a family member, said to me one time when I was uh, a young guy, she said, Jay, honey, are you a good swimmer? I said, what? She said, are you a good swimmer? I said, Granny, hello. I'm, I'm a scuba diver, certified, and I was certified to be a scuba diver like five years before you're allowed to be certified by what's called PADI, which is the number one certification for scuba divers. And I said, number two, I'm at the beach every day. I live, I'm a surfer. What do you mean do I know how to swim? She just says, honey, the way you act, you burn more bridges than anybody I've ever seen. And I'm just telling you because I love you. Make sure you're a good swimmer. Now, I don't know if you think that's applicable, but my grandmother nailed me right in the car, right? Because with that, my attitude, or I didn't need any help, or I don't want anybody, or come on, man, let's just get through this. My attitude was burning bridge after bridge. So this thing, mentally, and by the way, the more we learn about mental intelligence and mental strength, we realize how close that is also to my emotional strength. So you need to prepare yourself mentally, that's called IQ, and you need to prepare yourself emotionally, and that's EQ. How do you handle life? If you get knocked down, can you get up? If, if you've had a setback, can you recover? If you've gone through some problems, can you meet that challenge? It's called resilience. And I want you to know, mentally, emotionally, and then, of course, spiritually. Are you made complete spiritually? Please, young guys, young ladies, I hope you know that you know that you know that you know that if something crazy happens in the world and everybody's got three minutes' notice, I mean, I'm just saying, absolute worst-case scenario, somebody does something stupid, and today we got the means that if somebody does something stupid, we're in guacamole. You know what I'm saying? But if I were to die in a car wreck, if I were to die, I'm on a plane almost every day. If a plane goes down, a car wreck, I've been in a lot of situations that, are, that intelligent people would have never been in. But I want you to know, I know that I know that I know that if I died tonight, I know where my future is. I know my hands, my life are in his hands. And that, I'm telling you, that gives you courage, that gives you resolve, that gives you power. So there's mental and emotional. You've got to prepare yourself spiritually. Let Him come into your life and fill that emptiness instead of a bottle pill or cheap thrill or some other thing. You've got to prepare yourself physically. 
You better take care of yourself. And I was doing so much destructive things to my mind, my heart, my life, and uh, the, the motorcycle accidents and the car wrecks and driving them on to the influence of high. And, you know, I got in a fight in Chicago with a gang. Never seen a real gang before. I was from Southwest Florida. I said, man, you guys are cute. Your mama done dressed you all alike. <laughs> I still have crooked teeth after about eight efforts not to because the baseball mat right about here can sort of, a, but anyway, that's another story. But I just want you to know, you and I need to be prepared mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically. Does that make sense or is that just noise? Okay? Relationally. Come on, guys, ladies. You got a teacher that say, "Man, how can I help you?" You got. Do you know that some of the teachers that made life the worst for me on this campus, <coughs> the absolute drove me crazy. I thought they hated me. Are the two people that said, "I think he's got some things going on. He doesn't even know he's got going on." So I told you about that. You know, they found out I was dyslexic. They found out I was A-D-D-D-D-D-D, right? I told you about all that. And those things that the two teachers that I thought were always on my case and on my back were the two folks that said, man, we ought to see something. He does real good over here, but over here, hello, you know? And so I just want you to know, relationships matter. And so when somebody goes, how can I help? Somebody goes, man, I'm here if you want to talk. Take advantage of that. The ability, please write this down, guys and ladies. This is gold. I promise you, 20 years from now, your life can be 100 miles higher than you ever dreamed you'd be able to go. If you learn how to build meaningful, write it down, meaningful, lasting, positive relationships. Meaningful, lasting, Positive relationships. I had a gentleman pick me up at Uber yesterday when I flew in. And I said, man, how you doing? What all's going on? He said, well, I'm doing pretty good. I just moved here from Texas. I said, well, man, why'd you leave? Why did you come here? Well, my mom, is, uh, uh, she's uh, lost her sight. And we think dementia set in. And, and my mom's having all kinds of problems. And my sister's. Are, are too busy, they don't, want, they don't seem to want to help. And so here's a guy that moved across country and said what? I want to be here for my mom. And yet here he is trying to have two jobs and you know, I mean, it's a remarkable young guy. But are you the kind of person that anybody can count on today? Today or in the future? Are you the kind of person people will go, man, I'm glad I know her. I'm glad I know him. That guy, if he's on your side, you you know you got a good tag team partner. Okay, so relationships, the ability to build meaningful, lasting, positive relationships, and educationally, what you're going to do this year is going to lay the foundation for really probably the rest of your life. So if I were you, I'd put an end to average. If I was you, I wouldn't come just dragging into class. If I were you, I'd put a little thought in it. I'd put a little effort in it. What you put in is what you get out. Now, hey, I got about seven pieces of paper hanging on the wall. I've written 28 books. I was 25 till I'd read more than two books. <laughs> All right? So I just want you to know what you're doing in this class this year can change your world, all right? So don't quit halfway up the mountain. Go all the way to the top. Walter, how much time we got? 40 minutes. 40 minutes. Man, anybody want to go get us some Cokes and some <laughs> snack, a little Chick-fil-A? You will to get You're so sweet. You, you don't buy for all of us? You'll do almost anything to get a 40 minute. I would I'll get a 40 minute break, right? All right. I want you to, let's turn to the next page in, to the online slides. You ready? 
I want to talk to you about your dream. Because your dream can change the world. Now there was a guy named, what was that guy's name a long time ago? Said he had a dream. What was that guy's name? Uh, oh man, what? Dr. Who? Dr. Martin. Dr. Martin Luther, that's right. Very good. Here's Dr. King. He makes a statement that helped change America. Now, America's still not perfect, but I promise you, if it hadn't been for Dr. King, there's no telling where we would be. One of the greatest men I've ever heard about, ever read about, ever studied. And can I just let you in on a secret? After Dr. King was savagely, cowardly, gunned down, and we lost Dr. King 20 years, we missed out having him alive and being an influence on our lives. But I was with Mrs. King, his widow, and I was with Andrew Young, his closest friend, longtime associate, and a very prominent uh, figure in the government of the United States, and several of the children. And we were at Sotheby's, which is the big auction house in New York. And we were trying, for a project I was working on, be able to get the library of Dr. King and make sure, and we started talking about this before it was a thing, we want to make it accessible to everybody. Everybody needs to know what Dr. King said. So here's Mrs. King. And here's her daughters, and here's Andrew Young. And you know what we discovered? We discovered Dr. King's, because all his papers and archives were there, before the King Center was built, okay? And Mrs. King didn't have insurance, and Dr. King was so busy trying to change the, the way people think and change uh, the course of history for, for his people and for our country, and he's gunned down cowardly, and his wife, there was no big insurance policy. I mean, his wife, that she was still living in the home 40 years after what happened. And now the roof, I mean, you know, so these were some real needs. And so we're going through some of their artifacts, and everybody's saying, you need to give that to this college and that college. And my humble but accurate opinion was, Mrs. King, I think Dr. King would want you to do what would help you be taken care of. You've given enough. Would you agree with that? <laughs> she gave her husband. She's given enough. So whatever you got, you want to sell, somebody makes a good offer on, I'd take it. And here was his report card from college. And I want you to write this down. The lowest grade that Dr. King ever made Sounds ridiculous. Was in public speaking. <laughs> Hello? Is somebody on crack? What about public speaking? He's if you've ever heard Dr. King speak, he's one of the greatest orators, speakers in the history of the planet. And he had a college professor. Excuse me. He had a college professor that wrote on his report card, Dr. King, I don't think you've got much of a future in public speaking. Now, how would you like to be that teacher? If that's not a duh, disqualification to even be allowed to walk around in public, that Can you imagine telling Martin Luther King, you, all, you have no future in speaking? His lowest grade. I say that because everybody's had somebody not believe in him. Everybody's had somebody diminish them. Martin Luther King, I'm sorry, Martin Luther King. Uh, Michael Jordan was cut from the team. He had to go play ninth grade basketball. Cut from the team. Michael, you don't really have much of a future in basketball, the coach said. By the way, he invited that coach to be at his induction to the NBA Hall of Fame. Come on, that's a pretty cool moment. The guy that cut him and he played, 
had to go play ninth grade ball. He was in his room crying. And his dad came in and said, Michael, you're not going to lay in here and cry. Get yourself up and get down to that gym. Dad, it's locked. He said, Michael, you don't know how to get in a gym that's locked. There's not a window. That... You can get in that gym. I want you to get in that gym and I want you to practice hours every night and make that coach eat his words. Now, maybe it's my background or whatever. I like stuff like that. Now, I wouldn't have been even been able to get up to the window, much less be able to get in. And I certainly would have never had the skills to be what Michael Jordan is. I just want you to know he was dissed. He was told he didn't have it. So you and I need to learn from that. So Dr. Dreams, Dr. Dream, Dr. King, we ought to call him Dr. Dream, said, I've got a dream. And it changed history. But do you have a dream? Leadership is described, there's really two ways to describe leadership. Please write this down. Leadership is vision. If you don't see yourself as being able to make a difference, nobody else will. If you don't think you have anything to say, no one else will. If you write yourself off, nobody cares. They, they'll write you off. Leadership is vision. Leadership is having a dream. We're going to talk about all that. But look here, one other thing for leadership. I said this, I think, the first time I talked to you. The one word definition, please write this down, of leadership is influence. I don't mind telling you, I want to be a leader. I don't really care about the title. I don't even care about the position. But if I can influence, if I can help somebody get out of the ditch like I was in the ditch and people helped me get out of the ditch, if I can influence people, if I can influence by giving hope or I can influence somebody by helping them. So leadership is vision and leadership is what? Influence. And young ladies, I'm going to go out on a limb here. But I don't... I don't know if the young ladies sitting in this room have any idea the influence you can have. That you can have on your friends or some other people that are in need. Someday your family. Some of us, who knows what? Guys, come on guys. Remember I said the first time we talked, there's got to be a time the little boy sits down and the man stands up. There's got to be a time the little girl sits down and the young woman stands up. And this is for free. If you got an IQ above plant life, that's most of us, right? I hope so. Yeah, that's most of us. There's some things that could happen on this planet that we're gonna, you're going to need to step up. You're going to need to be willing. What can I do to help make a difference? For me, for my family, for those around me. I mean, I promise you, little boy, I mean, I don't want to be exaggerating. I don't want to get hysterical. I don't want to try to use scare tactics. But if you can know or hear what's going on on the planet, and you get China and Russia and Iran, you get them together, and who's the one nation? They, they all hate Israel. But guess who they really hate? We're the great Satan. Because we're the ones who stand beside Israel. Folks that had no hope land, six million annihilated, and we gave them, the UN gave them a little tiny piece of land. And it's become one of the most incredible nations in the world. Now that doesn't mean Palestinians don't matter. That doesn't mean Palestinians don't have a right. I mean, all that is complicated, but you don't ever be that coward that blows up children and women and grand grandparents and men. Woman, come on. So just know 
let's sit down as a child and let's let the young man and the young woman stand. And I promise you, you're the only one that can do that. All right? So, now let's talk about it. Now here's a great quote from two of the greatest leadership gurus. Dr. Gertis, I'm speaking your love language here. Posner and Coots, all right? <laughs> Exemplary leaders are what? Say it with me. Forward. Not, not so loud. We don't want to disrupt the other classes. But let's say, what is it? Say it. Forward, Forward thinkers. Has anyone in your life, I promise you, I had to be in my 20s tell anybody ever said about me he's a forward thinker. But, listen to me. Exemplary leaders are forward looking. They're able to gaze across the horizon of time and imagine greater opportunities to come. Now, if you don't believe in you, probably not a whole lot of people will. Mama will. Grandmama will, a couple people will, but after a while we can wear their, them out. But if, if you want to, that could be you. Forward looking. So let's talk about the definition of a dream. You ready? So turn to another sheet of paper, make this separate. This has been the one session that we do at Student Leadership that gets the greatest response for 28 years. And I could spend three hours telling you about young people telling me about the dream they wrote down in the ninth grade or 10th grade. And now today they're doing that and much, much more. So I promise you what we're about to talk about is for real. So let's look at what it means to have a dream. All right? So there's three words. I want you to kind of write it and leave a space in between. So if you're typing, you know how to do that. Put one word and then scroll down and then put another word and do the same. Three terms you need to know. Dream. We're going to define a dream. Your dream, not my dream. Your dream. What is a dream? Number two, what's a vision? Is there a difference between the two? Yes, there is. And number three, what is a goal? These three questions and these three terms, I promise you, if I never see you again, some of you will go, man, I'll be glad when this guy's not here every day. But I just want you to know, these three things, if you get nothing else, I'm asking you to lean in on this because this is the game changer. Alright, number one, what's a dream? Now there's a guy named Walt Disney. I don't know if you've ever heard of him or not. But Walt Disney is considered one of the most creative people to ever live. Walt Disney, of course, has changed the world. I was in, are you ready? the largest slum in the world. And I saw four or five kids, I'm talking about in Kenya, according to the United Nations, according to, the, I mean, the largest, most desperate situation in the world. And I saw at least three kids wearing a Mickey Mouse shirt. And they're on the other side of the world they have nothing. Some of them are living in rooms, homes about the size of maybe these two desks put together. And situation is hopeless. And there's a Mickey Mouse on their shirt. Mickey Mouse is everywhere. It is the most used image in the world. Okay? Now, so what is a dream? What did this creative ingenious guy how did he define a dream three words please write it down just imagine if just 
imagine if. Now think about that. That's his definition of a dream. Now you know Walt Disney started painting pictures on helmets during World War II. Started painting pictures on helmets. He put a bullet hole and then he'd sign it. And there was a phrase, Kilroy was here. He started drawing that, putting it on. And other soldiers would buy those. And then, you know what he did? He started, he saw all the great castles in Europe. And he started painting castles on helmets. Now you say, what's, what's that got to do with anything? Anybody ever been to Disneyland? California? Anybody ever been to Disney World? You ever seen it on TV? Know anything about it? Guess what their landmark is? A castle. So here's a guy that wasn't very good. His dad always criticized him. His dad said, son, you don't have any skills. You're not doing this. And so he came back from the war and, you know, he knew he was good at drawing. Do you know Walt Disney was fired for three jobs? From three jobs? Do you know Walt Disney literally faced bankruptcy twice? His last job, he was fired, and you know what a guy said to him? You don't have any talent when it comes to drawing. You don't have any imagination. You don't have any future. He was fired. Walt Disney, considered the most creative guy, we've already talked about the greatest probably one of the greatest orators in the history of the world, Dr. King. We've already talked about Michael, Michael Jordan. These are two pretty successful, unbelievable, one-of-a-kind kind of talents. So you, did, you can't ever let other people describe you. Does that make sense? Especially you got some folks, they can barely, you know, dress themselves. So I'm going to worry about their opinion? I don't think so. All right. Now, one other thing. You know where Mickey Mouse came from? He got fired from his third job. And with the last bit of money he had, he sold his camera and bought two train tickets for he and his wife, and they were going to California to live with his brother, Roy. And on the train ride, Walt started doodling, drawing. He was always drawing. And he drew a mouse. And his wife says, what is that? He said, oh, this is my friend Mortimer. She said, what do you mean your friend Mortimer? He said, yeah, you know, the last job I worked, you know, the, you know, till, you know all the night shift till about five in the morning. And he said, sometimes in the middle of the night, I would go to eat the sandwich that had been prepared for me. I'd get it out of my brown paper bag. And it, there was a, a mouse in the, the corner of this upper room where their, his office was. And after several months of offering the mouse a little piece that he'd run, get it, run, eventually he would come up on Walt's desk and eat part of the sandwich. And now Walt's fired and he's on a train. He's bankrupt. He's got no money. He's told he's got no ability. He's on a train ride to live with his brother. And his wife goes, who's that? That's Mortimer. And she, he told the story. She said, Walt, you can't give an everyday mouse a highfalutin name like Mortimer. you got to give an everyday mouse an everyday what? Name. I think we all know who the mouse is, right? And that became Mickey Mouse. Worst conditions, discouraged, depressed, hopeless, told time and time again, you don't have it. And by the way, considered arguably the most creative guy to ever live. Now, you know how he describes a dream, ladies? Did you ever watch, let me talk to the ladies a minute. Did you ever watch any Disney movies when you were little and growing up? Did you? Has everybody here seen at least one Disney movie like Sleeping Beauty or, you know, Cinderella, right? You know. And you know what's so funny is that uh, 
There's a great definition. Whenever I ask people, what do they think Walt Disney's definition of a dream is? Anybody want to take a guess? Anybody? What do you think that, based on the movies maybe that you've seen before when you were younger, what do you think that is? Anybody? A dream is a what? Don't be afraid. Go for it. I mean, what are we going to do? Take away your birthday? Come on. Anybody think you know? A dream is a what? A wish. A wish your heart makes. Would you mind singing that for us? No. <laughs> no. That's why you were me. I'm not saying a word. I don't trust that guy. I don't blame you. Smart. Odd. A dream is a wish your heart makes. Now look at me, ladies. That's a beautiful line for a beautiful love story in an imaginary movie. But that's not how Walt taught his employees to think. His definition of a dream to his employees, and by the way, there was a songwriting duo who came up with that great line, and, and everybody knows it and loves it, especially all the young ladies in the room. The guys are going, what, what, what? But anyway, now look, he said, here's a three-word definition, and write this down, of a dream. Just, three words, just imagine if. Please write that down. Just imagine if. And here's the rest. Please get this. And I want you to make it first person. What would I do? What would I do? And no one's going to see this. You're not turning this in. What would I do if I knew I could do anything I wanted to do? Now, no one's looking but you and, and the Lord. Huh? What would I do? What would you do? What would you do Here's the second part. If you didn't have to worry about money. Well, you know, I'd, I'd like to do this, but I'd never, I'd never be able to get that training, or I'd never be able to go to that school, or I'd never be able to go to that play. I mean, you know, a lot of times we immediately go, well, I'd like to do that, but I'll never have the money. Does, you ever had that thought? Or what would you do if you knew no one would ever say, you're not pretty enough? You're not smart enough. You don't have what it takes. Guys, what would you do if you could do anything? You're not big enough. Man, I'd like to play in the NBA. <laughs> you don't have it. You're not big enough. So we're told as young men and young women all of our lives, and by the way, because of my learning disabilities and the fact that I couldn't write, and I was told a hundred times, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? Why can't you sit still? What's wrong with you? Why can't you write your letters right? What's, and when, you're, when you're asked, what's wrong with you, so many times, guess what you start asking yourself? What's wrong with me, man? Why can't I write? Why can't I read? Why can't, am, I, am I dumb? Am I stupid? What, you know, when everybody's always saying you're not smart enough why do you do that what's why do you and we hear that and we settle for that so Walt Disney says what would you do if you didn't have to worry about how much money you had or how pretty you are or how much talent you have or how much money you have or how big you are or who's your daddy who's your mom I mean what would we do if we could do anything and no one would laugh at us or mock us or put us down. Bless you. What would you do? Does that make sense? And I'm going to ask you in just a minute that question. And I want you to, for once in your life, go out on a limb. I'm being facetious when I say once in your life. I don't know you well enough to say that, but I have the microphone so I can say it even though I don't know you well enough to say it, right? But what would you do 
if you could do anything you wanted to do, and you don't even have to go 20 years in the future. Well, what would you like to be? Where would you like to be three years from now, five years from now? What would you like to do with your life? What would you do if you could do anything? I'm going to ask you to write that down for just a moment. No one's going to see it but you. And there may be a couple things. I don't know. But until you have a dream, you're going to probably drift through life. Hmm. And until you believe you're important enough or special enough to do something, you're going to probably drift along the rest of your life. Okay? So what would you do? How much time? Now, that's a dream. Fair enough? Is that a good definition? So write something down. Even if it, I won't be an astronaut. All right, write it down. Whatever it is, what would you do? Wouldn't it be cool if I could do this? Wouldn't it be far out, man, if I could do this? You know what I used to think, because I grew up on commercial fishing boats, five of my six stepdads were commercial fishermen. I'm on the ocean half my life, it seemed like, or the Gulf. And uh, I remember <clears throat> looking out and I saw ships because we'd be 60, 70, 80 miles off the coast of Florida or Texas, wherever, the Gulf or the Atlantic. And uh, I saw all these ships from all these different countries. And I used to watch all that and I'd go, man, I wonder what it's like to go to that place. Man, it'd be cool to go to that place. I mean, I'd read about places, Malaysia, Singapore, Hong Kong, the Mediterranean, you know, I mean, all these far away, far out places. By the way, I don't know what it means, but I've been to 47 countries. But as a kid that had no clue, no hope, no anything, there was always something in my mind. I wonder what it's like there. I've been to 47 countries. Some of them, like I told you, Israel, 101 times. I just got back from... Uh, Egypt. I don't know when was the last time I was here, but probably in the last five weeks or so I just got back from Egypt. And that was for like the eighth or ninth time. So, I just want you to know there's something about when you go man, wouldn't it be cool? I wonder what that's like. You'd be surprised the power or the draw that can have on you. Alright? But what would you do? Alright? If you could do anything. Where would you go? Who would you like to help? Well, man, I wish I could learn to play this. I wish I could learn to sing that. I wish, I wish, I wish. That's a dream, man. Just imagine if. So, if you have a dream, now if you don't have a dream, you didn't write anything down, you're happy and content with how life is, then I congratulate you. because. I speak to a lot of people and there's less than... I have a buddy named Ralph Tillman. I went to high school with him. He picked up a firecracker that didn't go off when he lit it. And he went and picked it up and it had a late burning fuse. He had it in his hand and it blew. And he lost two and a half fingers. So that was my buddy Ralph. Went through life, two and a half fingers mentioned. So let me make a statement. I can count on Ralph Tillman's right hand the number of people that go on to do something remarkable that didn't have a dream. So this is a this is kind of a game changer. This is kind of for what it's worth. And what's amazing is, if nobody else believes in you, you can. And re again, remember my main thought in life. I think I'd like to try that. And what do they don't do? Take away my birthday? You know what they don't do to me? They can say I'm dumb or I'm stupid. They were already doing that. I didn't have zippity doo dah to lose, but I had a dream. All right. So. A dream, just imagine it. Alright, second step. 
what is a vision? What is a vision? So please write this down. Vision is a dream with direction. Anybody can go, man, it'd be cool to do this. It'd be great to do that. I wish I could do this. But a vision is when all of a sudden you go, well, you know, maybe I ought to read a book about that. Can I, I can't tell you. I bet it's been over a hundred times, guys, ladies, where a young man or a young lady said, man, I'd like to be a fighter pilot. Or I'd like to uh, uh, be an admiral and be over a ship. Or I'd like to be in special forces. I'd, I mean, you know, I, I promise you, hundreds that I know that have told me that are doing it right now. 25, 26, 28. Unbelievable. Two girls, I get a call from two girls, twin girls, Dr. J, and they graduated SLU four years. Would you write a letter for me to, I want to get in the military academy. I said, well, first of all, there's like three or four, right? There's Navy, Army, Air Force, Coast Guard, you know. And one of the twin girls, and this was uh, so funny, one of them said, I want to go to West Point. Now this is a girl. What can a girl do? Come on, let's be serious. See, now I've got your attention. <laughs> what you talking about, Willis? All right. Anyway, that's too old of a reference, but some of you got it. All right. But I want you to know, one girl wanted to go to West Point, and the other one to the Air Force Academy. You got to get a couple congressmen to write a letter. You got to get some other people to write a letter. It's just us girls talking here, right? Just us girls. I took it to the president. I said, I'm telling you, these two young ladies are remarkable. And he wrote a note. Now, that's kind of an impressive note. You know. Whether you like whoever the president is, you get a note from the president. Hello. These two girls, young girls, forgive me, young women, are about six months away from graduating West Point Air Force Academy. Twin girls. Now, let me just say this as a man. How would you like to raise those two girls? Because <laughs> they're probably, you can't go out tonight. They go out through the bathroom window hot wire the car. I mean, you know, they could do anything. And one of them is already qualified to be a fighter pilot. She's already been doing enough training. They said, you got it. You're ready for the next step. I mean, it's unbelievable. You can do anything on the planet you want to do. Got a young guy right now that just told me he just got commissioned on the Air Force uh, carrier, the Iwo Jima, which is a very famous aircraft carrier through the years. And he's on it. And he's just like 14, his face breaking out. I notice those kind of things because I always have a face that broke out. <laughs> okay? So I'm just saying, that's, that's different kinds of that. I promise you, I bet if I had the time, I could even find it on my phone, but I got a call the other day from a young man whose song, he'd written three songs, and one of them went to number one on the country station. Now, I didn't even know, the, I mean, I'm a hippie, so what do I know about country and western music? You know what I'm saying? I mean, that just didn't blow my dress up. But he wrote this song, it's gone, and he didn't sing it, he didn't perform it, but he's the songwriter, and it went to number one in country. And then about three months later, he's got a, a, a song that's like number five on the, you know, rock channels, rock world. And this was a guy that said, man, I, I love writing and creating music. I, and here he is, a, he's wanting me to meet this guy and that guy. And, 
You know, this guy's performing on the stage with this per I mean, you know, it's unbelievable. And they were sitting in a chair, minding their old, own business, and their youth pastor, or their mom, or their dad, or their friend said, hey, I'm going to this crazy program in Orlando. There's this real cool, good looking, I mean, this crazy guy down there teaching. But I'm going, why don't, why don't you go with me? And she goes, and then they, you know, I'm here, might as well. What would you do if you could do anything? I can't tell you. I could keep you here all day with folks saying, that changed my life, and I'm doing it. Okay? So, for what it's worth, but you got to take this next step of vision. When they said, I want to go to the Air Force Academy, I want to go to the military, I, I, there was a book I recommended, which would be a great book for a course. <clears throat> I'm just thinking out loud here. In strategic leadership, but you know, I'm just thinking out. Oh, hey, Dr. Gertz, I didn't realize you were here. Sorry, but uh, and uh, a guy named Pat Williams, longtime friend of mine, the guy that brought the Orlando Magic to uh, uh, Orlando, Orlando Magic, duh, but you know, an NBA franchise, and you know, it's been pretty successful. And he's the guy that put all that together, was general manager. He's written a lot of books, and he wrote a book on what West Point really stands for. And there's like 12 benches. There you go. What's it called? Character carved in stone. Character carved in stone. I already use it in the doctoral course. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Did I get any credit for that? No. That's what I thought. All right, so, by the way, I've used a couple of them, but that's a, that you didn't get credit for. So there. No, all right. But anyway, understand there are these benches at West Point, and they've got sayings in them about honor and humility. And what have you ever seen them or heard about? I've been to West Point. Have you really? I've been there. Yeah, I got you. You're not going, you're not a commander there, no. or a secret agent, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> wow, was it pretty cool? Did you see the benches? Um, I've heard, I saw, yeah. I heard stories, but I didn't see. I got you. So anyway, I, I recommended that one. And there was another book uh, that uh, we had, uh, well, by the way, your former president, Dr. Costin, was a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force, and then he was at the Pentagon. And, uh, you know, so I was able to use several connections that they recommended me the book. So I, I recommend to these two young ladies, and because I knew Pat, I was able to get that book signed and get it sent to him. And so I'd send these out, each one privately, individually, and here they are. But you, you know what they did? They took a step. They read a book about what it is they said they'd like to do. You want to play basketball? Some pretty great books out. You want to play a certain sport? Some pretty phenomenal books out. You want to play an instrument? You like a certain kind of music? You love history, you love art. I mean, I take thousands of students to Rodin's sculpture gardens and where Rodin did all of his work and to, the, uh, to uh, Florence and Rome to study all some of the great artists. You know, you got all the Ninja Turtles. They were great artists. Michelangelo and Raphael and Donatello and Splinter. Wasn't Splinter a great art? No, I'm sorry. But anyway, how many of you even know who the Teenage Ninja Turtles are. Anybody? All right. I guess the really cool folks know, right? Don't you think? Uh, or we watch too much TV, you know one, right? It could be both. All right, so, but you got to read a book. Do you care enough about anything you want to do with your life? Now, I know we get all these books we're supposed to read, and we get all these books that are required, and so several times, this is just a suggestion, I go up, see the teacher after school or after class, and there wasn't anybody around, and I said, ma'am, can I ask a question? I know you want us to read and study, but I said, man, that book's like death on cracker. Is there another book that maybe I could read instead? And smart teachers and innovative teachers would go, 
Uh, well, let me see. Why don't you look around and see a book that you think would cover that and let me do the same. We'll talk. Now, she could have said, look, that's what you're supposed to do. That's the way it is. But we got jiggy with it. Maybe she was blown away that I actually wanted to read a book. I don't know, right? But I was able to pick out a book or two and was able to go to some countries. And you know what? I've now, I, I took a step. Take a step. Read a book. Talk to somebody that's done that. And by the way, this is for free, and this is going to be worth, if you, if you were to take what I'm about to tell you and do it, it'll be worth a million dollars to you. Okay? You have to plant a seed and send me a hundred. No, I'm kidding. All right, but anyway, come on, that was good. Right? But anyway, um, just want to, learning how to build meaningful, positive, lasting relationships is the greatest thing I've ever learned. Not faith, -wise. I mean, you know, obviously the Word of God. But, but the second thing is, are you ready? You're only three people away from anybody you want to get to. You're only three people away. The president, somebody at NASA, somebody with a professional sports team, now you'll have to take some initiative. You'll have to show, have a little skin in the game. Do you care enough to read a book? One book about that sport or that art or that uh, the military. I mean, what politics, whatever. But just show a little initiative. But I promise you this, young people. I promise you. You're only three people away from anybody you want to get to. Okay? Now, but you got to take a step. Nobody takes you seriously if you're going, yeah, man, that's what I want to do. Well, really, what, what are you doing? Well, I've read uh, this book. I've read this book, and, and by the way, I'm reading this book. Wow. What you think of I mean, that immediately says to somebody, you're a little serious about that. Now, look, sometimes we've got books we've got to read for class, and that's an important thing, too. You know that. Now, every once in a while, maybe you could ask for, could we do this? All they can do is what? Say no. What if I ask a teacher if I could get a different book? And what is she going to do? Tell me, what, what could she do? Take away my what? My birthday? No. So, I mean, you know, it doesn't hurt to ask. Be polite, be nice, take a little flower, so, some Pop-Tarts, no, whatever. But anyway, you want to just ask, okay? But show some initiative. You've read a book. You've talked to somebody that you know that has done that. And by the way, you could ask your pastor who knows a lot of people. You could ask some several here at the university. Do you know anybody that's with NASA? Or do you know anybody that's uh, an engineer? Do you know anybody? Is there any way I could talk to some of those that have been on an aircraft, aircraft carrier? What? I'm just throwing stuff out, but you know what I'm saying, right? Maybe it's songwriting. Maybe it's going on stage, being backstage, learning how things are done. But show some initiative. So a dream is just imagine. But what's a, what's a vision? It's when you start moving, what's the word? Forward. Write it down. Take a couple of steps forward. Nobody's going to spoon feed you. Nobody's going to tie you down and make you make you swallow something. You're going to have to show a little initiative. You're going to have to have a little skin in the brain in the game. So, what's a vision? It's dream with direction. I'm going to read a book. I'm going to talk to somebody. I'm going to take some initiative. Does that make sense? And then, then there's the goal. Amen. What's a goal? Here it is. A dream with direction, dedication, and a deadline. It's not a goal if you don't have a deadline. 
man, I'd like to graduate college. All right? When? You got to have a deadline. I'd like to get out of this class and move on. Well, what do you need to do to do that? You got to have a dream, direction. We're moving. We're moving. We're moving forward. We're taking a couple steps. How did I know what I knew about Dr. King that got me in the room with Andrew Young and Mrs. Mrs. King and several of their children that were all grown adults? It didn't just happen because I'm that cool. I mean, well, that had a lot to do with it, but primarily I'd I'd shown interest. I'd cared about what how Mrs. King was doing. I asked. Uh, Andrew Young, what could be done for the King family? And, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm just a, I, you know, I'm a cracker from the South. You know, I, you know, I, but I know what's right and I know how much I love Dr. King and I just think everybody needs to know what Dr. King did. And next thing I knew, I was here, I was there, I got to go here. Does that make sense? Just show some initiative. Adults are blown away with a teenager that can take a step that will walk up and look them in the eye and shake their hand and ask a question. A dream with direction, dedication, and what? A deadline. You ever watch people in their undershorts running up and down the court dribbling a basketball? I mean, that's about... Now, nowadays, baggies are cool. But back in the day, hello, you know, they were little old shorts and a bunch of guys running up and down. But if they didn't have a goal, they were trying to put the, the, put the rock in the net, if they weren't trying to put the ball in the hoop, if, listen to me, you got to have a goal, or otherwise you got a bunch of people running around in their shorts. Does that make sense? Goals matter. So have a goal. And by the way, that's kind of what this class is doing. You know, if you want to earn some extra credit, you could come at 3 o'clock somewhere today, I think, on campus right here in this room, and we're going to talk about anything you want to talk about. Fair enough? How I became such a great dancer. I, no, but anyway, anything you want to talk about, it's kosher. Okay? You want to talk about what all is going on on the planet? Anything. Maybe you want me to sit and listen to you. I'm happy to do that. But just take, take that step. Take a little, mm, and you'll be blown away what can happen. And when you're rich and famous, you hear me? And I call you and I go, I got this young person. They want to do this. I was crazy enough to tell them you're three people away. You're my one person. I need you to deliver. Fair enough? Fair enough? All right. How much time we got left, Doctor? Uh, I think that's about it. Yeah. That it? Yeah. Hey. That's a minor mirror, <laughs> isn't it? Anything we need to know about this course or tonight or tomorrow? Or? Uh, no, so the event is in here. So it'll be downstairs. Downstairs. Okay, so um, I am offering extra credit um, documented attendance, is what we're calling it. Um, so if you want to come today at 3 p.m. downstairs, it's in 101. One or two. One or two. So uh, the big auditorium is coming in. So one or two at 3 p.m. to come here, Dr. Strack, or just test room with questions. It sounds like that'd be great as well. And I promise you, if I don't know the answer, I'll come up with something really cool. Okay, fair enough. Sometimes you got to get jiggy with it. You know? So anyway, all right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Strack. Thank you, my hand.